a slightly longer talk that I've given a couple times and I'm trying to condense it. Uh, I'm going to cut out some experimental results, but I'll try to summarize them in a few words uh, for the first half of the talk. So, uh, you know, it's no surprise to anybody in this room that databases tend to be pretty eager. When you have kind of a traditional batch or analytic system, you know, most of these systems work, you give it the query, the database is going to do all it can do to get you that answer as fast as possible. And for most stream systems or IVM systems, basically as soon as a set of records, small set of records or single set of records arrive, the database is more or less going to do all it can do to get those prepared results up to date immediately. And this eager execution model, you know, uh, meeting this kind of growth of data is problematic in a number of environments. For people running on cloud or serverless or pay per use, this eager execution model results in them spending more money. If you're in an environment where you have a fixed amount of resources, that eager execution is taking away from computation or resources that could be used for other jobs. If you're running on an edge or a mobile device, that eager execution is going to result in you losing battery faster. Obviously, if we're running eager execution, we're using more resources and there's a growing concern about the impact on the environment from computing resources. And lastly, is that people or systems have very limited attention. This eager execution and doing things as fast as possible is not always a good idea because somebody might not look at the result quick enough or it might not even be it might be too fast for a system to take action. So in particular in this work we're thinking about kind of dynamic data that's changing where we have some form of regular reports that are running with some regular interval and there's some time periodicity associated with them. So imagine we have a dashboard we have data that's constantly coming in and we have reports that are running with different kind of intervals that are that are semi regular. And that's going to kind of be our focus for this. And so here, just to get everyone to make sure on the same page, we're thinking about a data set that's analyzing under change. We have a query that's more or less scheduled. I'm at some point in time now. I know I'm going to execute this, this query in the future. I have records coming in. From the time that I execute that query, when I have all of my records for that window, from the time that I get the result, that's going to be my, what I'm going to define as latency here. And a lot of prior work is really focused on these types of systems. And we've really thought about how do we take the latency and make the latency you know, quicker. Let's shrink the latency. And a lot of these systems do this through mechanisms like looking at eager execution models, right? What I talked about before. These are more or less thinking about, I have some form of state associated with this query. I have a hash table from the join. I have a hash table from the aggregation. I have a sorted output or whatever. And I'm going to keep that state and I'm going to maintain that state as new records come in. And that's what I'm going to do. And by doing this, what we're doing is we're trying to drop that latency on that, the y-axis here, but this is going to be at the cost at more resource consumption. And I'm going to use more CPU to maintain this result. I'm going to use more memory to keep that state around in there. So it's really about a trade-off between resource consumption and latency. Traditional lazy systems, batch analytic systems, whatever, do nothing until the result's ready, in which case we're going to suffer a higher qu query latency to get this, but we're going to use less resources in the meantime. Why those records are coming in, I'm not going to really do anything to maintain that query. And so a lot of this work that we've been thinking about is what sits in the middle. What's this case for kind of not necessarily up to the millisecond or real-time analytics, but I know I have this kind of near real-time-ish analytics where I have regular reports going that's going to sit in between this kind of lazy batch system and this immediate IVM streaming system, what sits in the middle. And in particular, we're thinking about cases where we have some form of time slackness. What are basically games that we can play when we know that we have some time in order to execute this work? I know that you know I'm running this data and I only have to get, I have an hour to get it ready or I have 30 minutes to get it ready. So what kind of things can I do to exploit that? So what's in this middle ground? And then in particular, when we think about resource efficiency, we're thinking about a couple of things. We're thinking about, well, can I fix the same amount of resources and drop the latency, which everyone's interested in? Or I think more interestingly is, can I keep um, the same latency and use less resources? What kind of things can I do to, to use less resources to get us there? And that's this notion of resource efficient databases. So again, I'm thinking about what's this middle ground between latency and resource consumption, and what are the kind of tricks I can play to be more efficient in what we're trying to do? Now, our community has done a lot for resource efficiency. And if you think about the core query optimizer, that's about minimizing resource efficiency, right? Or, or maximizing res resource efficiency. It's saying like, you know, resources correlate with latency, IO, so forth. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna make a plan and make that plan as most efficient as possible to get you the result as quick as possible. I'd say more in line with what we're thinking about is more of this shared query execution. It's going to be this notion of, hey, I have two queries that are very similar. I'm going to kind of put them together and individually they both might suffer some they might actually get slower because there's extra data involved that you know each side is necessarily not interested in but the overall system resource utilization is improved because i no longer have to execute this query twice maybe execute a large part of it once this kind of killing two birds with one stone 
And this is going to be a little bit closer in line with what we're going to talk about today. Uh, there's obviously work on approximate query processing or approximate hardware, which improves resource utilization. I'm not going to talk about that today at all. Uh, there's obviously this notion of multi-tenancy. Let me put a bunch of things together to get increased utilization of the system. I'm going to be focusing on single tenant, single user kind of uh, work. Obviously thinking about hardware accelerator or using more specialized hardware can bring uh, improved resource efficiency. I'm not gonna talk about that. And then there's work on kind of like raw DB, no DB, that's in void ingestion. Um, we have some work on that. I'll talk about that for like two seconds, but that's not gonna be a focus of that today. So our vision is basically that database systems really need to be able to take explicitly information about timing and quality objective, performance objectives, and how fast do I need this? When do I need this result by? You know, when am I going to run this result for us to make better decisions about how do we overall improve the resource utilization? And I'll, I'll get into this in specifics, but can we avoid unnecessary computation or wasted memory resources? And we want to do these things by basically kind of building better hooks throughout the whole database. How do I get better integration throughout the whole system of how to exploit resource utilization better? And we're going to do this largely by using predictive models. This will become clear in a second. So this is Crocodile DB. This is our, our, our uh, system that we've been trying to build. And you know, the inspiration for this in part was to think about, you know, we've seen those, you know, National Geographic specials where you watch a crocodile hunting, it kind of lays in the water, it doesn't do a lot, it waits till the thing gets close and then it moves fast and goes for it, right? So it was kind of our joke that it's it's a fast animal, but that looks lazy a lot. And you know, before before COVID, which feels like a million years ago, uh, we had uh, a chance to snapper running around Chicago. For those of you not familiar with Chicago, it's it's worse weather than Amsterdam. So us having an alligator here, we had a chuckle out of that. Okay, so in building crocodile DBs, we had a couple of design goals. We wanted to figure out basically where are the opportunities for trade-offs of resource and performance. What are mechanisms that we can allow users to specify uh, the performance requirements? What are the signals that we can use to inform our decisions? And a lot of this work is really thinking about, you know, with these knobs and with this information, how do we set the right knobs, right? What are the physical mechanisms we can do? What are the policies? And how do we set these policies to meet our performance goals? And this is Crocodile DB at a high level. So I'm going to talk about the top bar and the bottom bar in a second, and the middle bar of various research projects that we've been working on, kind of key components. You know, it has all the standard things that a database has, you know, query execution, optimizers, and so forth. And I'm going to talk about two of these research projects, um, intermittent query processing and, and incremental aware query execution. I'm going to try to do the IQP one a bit shorter because it's a little bit older now, and it's, um, it, you know, has a lot of overlap with Recycler. So the policies and requirements, the top bar, we think these are things that are very different from traditional database systems today that need changes in order to improve resource utilization and efficiency. So one is query registration. So how do people specify queries, right? So, you, you know, I think the, uh, the Beam folks did a pretty good job at this, but I think there's more to be done here. So how do you give a query and give more specific performance uh, objectives or how do I want to see this query running? So, you know, every five minutes run this query, uh, uh, and then do it for the next 30 minutes, run this query when I see this many tuples or when the result changes by some threshold. And when you run this interval, is it just rerun the entire result or just show me the difference from the prior result? And as, as well as thinking about push versus pull, is it the case that somebody has to come to the system or can we build more asynchronous models where somebody gets notified when a result changes? Um, the performance objectives we've been spending a lot of time thinking about and this is a hard problem, which is how do we actually model exactly when do they need the result by? So is it, I'm running this query every five minutes and you have 30 seconds to look at it, or could it be something that's a little bit more implicit? Like somebody sets up a batch job to run a report every day, but I can tell that nobody ever looks at this result until 8 a.m. So can I infer that I have this much time slackness before somebody actually reads the result? Some of the work that I'll talk a little bit later is more also about this kind of hypothetical knob or can I just turn something between these extremes of, hey, wait till you have everything and run it, batch mode, versus, hey, as soon as you get a new record, integrate it. And how do we kind of go between this and show the user what's the difference in the expected performance, as well as the expected cost of resource utilization. We're going to rely heavily on data prediction arrival. So can I predict where data is going to come? And this allows us to make really intelligent decisions about where should we invest our resources. And I think this will become clear why as I talk, but this is something that doesn't exist today that we think is pretty in integral. And then lastly is how do we kind of tightly couple resource allocation throughout the whole system? Right? In my opinion, databases are relatively static. You set it up, you have your configuration file, you boot it. You say, this is you know, your working memory, your buffer pool size, the thread pools and so forth, and it's more or less static. 
You know, we're thinking of a system that has to adaptively, you know, take away and give resources as needed, right? Why just have this query that's running and I say, this is how much memory you have all the time when the data arrival rates are changing or the amount of strain on the system is changing. So how to make these kind of resource allocation adaptive and flexible is a key component. Um, the bottom layer is, yeah, I think everyone here will be more or less, you know, familiar with it, but we've been thinking a bit about kind of raw data coming in, leaving it in its native format as long as possible getting it ingested out of that raw format into it, you know, some folks will call delta logs, so ingested, ready to go, but not necessarily propagated through the rest of the system. So the indices haven't been updated or, or tables or views. And then how are we intelligent about how do we take that data from those delta logs and propagate it through the system? So I've been thinking about kind of the lower stack and I'll talk about it for a second. And we're thinking about kind of um, different forms of kind of read my write consistency and escrowed loading where people give bulk files to be imported they get some form of token back and that's kind of how they use that token to get read my right consistency. So giving more opportunities to basically be lazy about how we load data because loading data is an expensive process. All right, so that's the high level pitch. If there's any questions on, on the high level motivation, it's a great time to ask right now. If not, I'm gonna drive into a particular project. I'm, I'm not sure about high level motivation, but I do have a question regarding yep. like, what are you asking? Let's say I ask, I want, I want to aggregate over my database and I want the answer at 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. And I get, I come at 8 a.m. and I, I read out the answer. Do I know, like, is there any sort of asset compliance? Do I know, like, okay, this is the result of my query at this, as it was at this point in time? Or, or how do I know what I'm reading? Great. That's a good question. And this is some of what we've been trying to reason about. But I, I think our intention at this point in time was that you specify the query. So I want to see data from, you know, midnight to 11.59 p.m and I need it by 8 a.m. the next day. And so, there, you know, in these streaming systems, there's always this case like, how do I handle late data? When do I start processing the system? So we're, we're kind of taking it as system time. So data that arrived in the system between the window that you specify is what will be included in the results. And the 8 a.m. is when I have to have it ready for you by. So the, the report must always be like, well, after the, the last data has come, come in and, and and you explicitly need to specify like a, a time series kind of. Yeah, like a, some kind of windowed query and that you're, yeah. Yeah, okay. some form of windowed query and then some form of performance objective of when you want that. Right, so, um, so it's not it's not like a version database where you can magically have every tuple versions and you, you get an answer at some point and you know, okay, it was, this was a snapshot of the database at that time. Yeah, it, it has to be pre-versioned already due to some time series. That's what we're doing right okay. now but you, you could imagine it where you keep going and you look at diffs of it and the diffs you can think of diffs as a version system yeah. in some way right like here, here i'm running this and i want to keep going um but it, what we'll get into is that makes uh, a lot of state prediction and state management much more harder right because it's wow, going to keep absolutely. growing growing yeah so yeah that's a tractability problem but i think for you know if you're going to make a company out of this you'd have to go it that way but great thanks Okay, so I'm gonna talk about briefly uh, intermittent query processing. I'll try to keep this shorter and I'm gonna kind of not go over the results to, so I can get to the, the more newer stuff and a little bit more interesting work, I think. So here, intermittent query processing is, you know, how do we basically strike a, a balance of resource utilization? In this case, I'm gonna think about memory and query latency. And here, our, you know, our key insight is we're going to try to leverage intermittent and predictable data arrival. So think again, we have a query, it's going to be running over time. Now for this query though, we're going to be updating the results. So I'm just going to change what I just said to Orson, but here we're gonna have some result. I'm periodically going to be updating the results and I'm going to be kind of keeping the data just kind of going in for this window. So imagine here I'm running it over 24 hours and I wanna see every hour some progress report on it. Every hour show me how is it going for this day. So over time, we're gonna have a large amount of data and we're gonna start some execution for this query. From the time that I start to the time that I execute, that's our latency again. And it's going to include all of the data to the start of this window. Now, over time, again, I want to see, you know, I'm going to have new records come in. These records are going to kind of come in and burst, which we see a lot with kind of reporting systems or IoT devices where it's not necessarily a constant stream of data, but every, you know, 10 minutes, somebody gives you a dump of new records. Again, I'm going to periodically try to update this result. So I'm going to say, hey, for this window, we want to say, what's, what's new? How have things changed? So we're going to maintain the result. And so that's going to be some execution where we say, okay, I'm going to take all of the records that have been added for this window and give you a new result. So in this kind of context, we're going to have some form of idleness, some period of time when we're not doing anything. So the question is, is what do we do in that idle time? 
So if I go back to that earlier analogy of that, those extremes of the systems, if we think about CQ systems or streaming systems, they tend to keep everything of the query ready to go. And as new records are coming in, maybe it's mini batch for every hundred records or whatever, I take them and I kind of just force them through that query plan and I keep that query up to date. So at all times, basically the query is ready to go. I take this as an analogy of I have a truck sitting outside of my house and it just leaves the engine running. Like it's constantly doing ready to go, but it's fast. The other case of a batch system, this is what a system like Postgres will do, is if you set it up to run, you have a query and data changes, it's just basically going to forget that it ever ran the query and it's going to redo it from scratch. It throws away everything. So the middle ground that we're thinking about, and I'm guessing this is no surprise to a few people on the call, is uh, can we be intelligent about what we keep? Can I say, let's make decisions about where the data is going to come and be intelligent about the subset of states that I'm going to keep? And if I do a good job of keeping the right state, you know, the right side effects from these query operators, I can give you a fast re refresh of that result. I can update the result fast and I can use less resources. I'll use less resources because I do a better job of, I can use less memory so I can kind of compress the state of the query in the idle time. And then also if I keep the right things, I don't have to do a lot of recomputation so I can use less resources to do it. Um, for the folks that worked on Recycler, this is more or less thinking about Recycler, but we're going to throw in some predictive models on top of it. So that's what we're trying to do here. We're saying I have a long standing query. I have some prediction of where data is going to come. I have the ability to give a query, a resource, a budget. In this case, the budget is the budget for the idle period. When I'm not doing anything, how much memory can the query use to basically shrink down and keep the kind of query partially warm, not all the way hot, not all the way cold. And that's going to be this budget. When the query is running, it's going to kind of be our standard resource allocation. So we have a query, we have a plan, we give a result. Then what we want to do is to say from this query plan, let's throw some things away and just keep this subset of state around. And then when I get new data in, think about how do I use kind of traditional IVM algorithms, incremental view maintenance algorithms to take these records and update that state that I partially have, and I can give a refreshed answer. So how do we choose the subset of states? So it's important here to think about how do we predict, understand where is data coming? And we care about two things, which tables are going to have changes. And for each table that's having a change, how many new records are going to have a change? For this work, the first question is way more important. I'll try to explain why in a minute, but the really important thing is understanding which tables are going to have changes. And I'll use a simple example to motivate this. Imagine I have a, a query that has a join between R and S. I'm doing a simple hash join. So I build a hash table on S and I'm probing records from R against that record in S. If you were to tell me that new records are only going to come from R and R alone, and you were confident on that, that hash table is great. I keep the hash table. I can forget everything else about S. And as if I get some new records from R, I just probe those records against the hash table and everybody's happy. However, if you were tell, going to tell me the opposite, that new records are only going to come from S and R is relatively static, that hash table is useless, right? I get some new records from S, I have to rescan R over and over again for all of these new deltas to get you that updated result. So I'm wasting state keeping that hash table and I'm wasting computation. So instead, in this case, if you knew this was going to be the case, is maybe we should flip this to something like a symmetric hash join. I run the hash table on the front, and then I can throw away that hash table on the right, keep the hash table on R, and then I, before I can do fast updates afterward. So this is for us a small motivation for why it's important to think about where data is going to come. So with this notion, we built this component called DIS, a delta-oriented intermediate state selector. So here we're thinking about I have a query plan, and I have some options of what can I keep. We have state that's being generated in the original plan that I can keep, a hash table from a join, a sorted output, and so forth. I have output that's not captured, but generated because I have pipelined execution. So I have some tree of the plan and some point in that time, data is being thrown away after this plan and we can inject a materialize operator to capture any arbitrary state from this, this tree of, of, of pipelined operators. Or I can generate new state that's not in the original plan, uh, but doesn't semantically change the plan at all, right? This is your standard query optimization. I have some kind of equivalence that I can run. I'm gonna generate new state and how do I do this? And so these are kind of the things that we're thinking about. We're building a selector that says, given a query plan, how do I go about this? So how this works is we built this first prototype on top of PostgreSQL. We took a query plan, we plugged it into Postgres's vanilla optimizer, we generate a new plan. Now, before we execute this plan, we hand the plan off to DIS. This takes in the plan, a budget, and a predictive model of where data is going to come. Then what it does is it modifies the plan in some way. So we inject materialized operators, we change hash joins and symmetric hash joins and so forth. 
And then with that budget, we say, we kind of annotate the plan to say, here are the things you need to keep. We give this annotated, updated plan to the Postgres execution. It runs that plan. After it's done, it throws away the things that weren't being told to cap. So it just kind of discards that and keeps that other state around. And so these are the things that we keep for this, this thing, we just keep them in memory. And then again, when we get new data comes in, we modified Postgres's execution engine to be able to take that data, effectively do those IVM algorithms and give an updated result using that data. So in this case, new data comes from just a T, we join it against the materialize, we join it against the hash table and we update the result as a diff. Okay, so that's what we do in this. And so the goal of this was basically thinking about how do we keep that delta time down, that time for that new data, while accounting for the, the cost of generating new state. Again, this is where I'm gonna concat the presentation, not get into the results. But effectively what we do is we use a dynamic programming solution to do this. You can think of this as a pretty simple optimization. We make simple optimizations on the dynamic programming solution. And, and that's gonna be our main solver. I won't get into the results, but we look at kind of flat TPCH queries. And we do a lot of our comparison against Postgres's uh, vanilla um, rebatch execution, which is basically throw things away and do it. And then we compare against a couple of versions of DB Toaster, uh, which was at the time state of the art for an IVM algorithm. We did DB Toaster native and then DB Toaster put it over to Postgres. And then we also do some comparisons against Recycler uh, ported over to Postgres as well. And Recycler does pretty well, but main difference between Recycler and this is Recycler is kind of a heuristic and retro. Here we're looking at what are the predictive cases. So obviously if we have good models, we're gonna do better than Recycler. If our models are total crap, us and Recycler are gonna to start to look a little bit more similar. I can happy to go over results at the end if we, people wanna get into details on experiments, but I'm just gonna do this so I can get onto other stuff. Okay, so IQP sits in between batch processing and CQ. If you have kind of bursty data, you can have some model of it. You can be intelligent about what you select and that will let you reduce uh, memory consumption when queries idle. It will keep your latency down and as a result also drop latency. Happy to answer any questions about IQP at this time, but I understand if, if I'm, because I'm skipping results that it might not be as good as the questions. And if we can do it at the end too. Okay, great. So I'm gonna spend the rest of the talk largely talking about our work on NQP or incremental aware query execution or query processing. And this appeared at Sigma 2020. So like I talked about before, we're thinking about how do we take latency for some scheduled regular query and shrink that latency. So I have all the data to the time to execute, I wanna shrink it. Systems do this again through some form of incremental execution. While the data is coming in, I start working on the query early and by start working on the query early, like I start, you know, I have per record or half the data or whatever, I'm able to, in theory, shrink my latency. Now, within incremental execution, though, there's this question of how eager or lazy should you be? Should you do it once? Should you do it for every record, right? For kind of modern systems, Flink and Spark and so forth, this, this is manifested through the mini batch size. How many records do you wait before you update the result, right? There's some knob in here that lets you say how eager do you want to be? And the idea is that the more eager you are, in theory, the faster the result should be at the end. What we'll talk about is that eager execution comes at an increased resource cost. But I think the key insight here is that sometimes that eager execution wastes work. You do some work early that actually doesn't contribute in the end. And this is a big problem with eager execution models. You're wasting work. So let's do a really simple motivating example. Imagine I have a query that's looking for customers who have a balance that's higher than the average balance. So this is the compute the average balance. And then here I'm trying to find the customers who have balance higher than the average. So I take my data, I run it, I have a result. Right? Imagine this is an eager incremental execution. I get some new record into the system. It's a new customer. Now this customer here, because it's going in, it's changing the stability of that, that average. And because it's changing the stability of that average, what's going to happen is I'm going to have to to update those join results. Records that were included in the join before need to be removed or potentially customers that weren't in that join now need to be included in that join. So there's some kind of condition in here that's saying, you know what, you did some work before, but the data changed. And now some of that work that you had done before is useless. We should get rid of it. It doesn't count in the end. It's no longer valid. So I have to get rid of that work and redo some work here. So in this idea of doing work early can potentially be wasted work. I did work that didn't contribute to the end. And that's our insight here for this work. 
And so what that means is while there's a trade-off between latency and resource utilization, it's not really fixed or known. It really depends on the query and how the data is changing, right? There's going to be this trade-off curve here that says, well, you want to drop the latency. That could be a sharp increase where I'm going to have to do a lot more work to get there. And that's going to come from wasted work. You know, I'm going to do work, but it's going to kind of have to constantly be undone. Or it could be pretty flat, right? Instead of saying greater than average, it's greater than 10. In that case, I'm wasting no work. Or if my average is relatively stable, I can do that work early and I'm going to get a, a huge return on investment for that latency without doing a lot of extra work. So this work is thinking about, can we understand where this waste comes in and can we be more intelligent about how we do things to be better at using our work? And it, I'm sure a couple of people are thinking right now, well, you know, it's not that the entire query wasted work, it's only certain parts of this query that wasted work. If we have, you know, only new data, no deletes or uh, uh, updates, but we'll handle that later. If I had inserts only, the maintaining of the average can have no wasted work. You give me a new record, I update that, that balance. That's great eager work. You just give it to me, I can do it. So if I have spare capacity, I can keep maintaining it. I'll never waste any of your, 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 your resources while doing this. It's the join that wastes work. So if we can think about this, if I could take my query and split it up to the parts that can potentially waste work and the parts that won't waste work, I can say, well, let's take my, my money, let's take my resources and put them on the things that won't waste work and be a little bit more lazy about the parts that will waste work. And so that's what we're going to do in this work in incremental aware query execution. What we're do, gonna do is we're gonna take a query plan, we're gonna chop it into paths. These paths are, uh, blocking to blocking, input to blocking, blocking to, uh, you, can, you can just, uh, I won't get into it too much, but basically what are the chunks where I, I know I have kind of natural checkpoints? What's going to be slightly different than I think traditional systems too here is an operator can belong to more than one path. If you look at that join, that join belongs to path C and path B. And so what that means is I can maintain certain operators asynchronously. You know, I can, I can update this, this operator with just data from the right, or I can update this operator just with data from the left. It doesn't have to be at the same case. So we're going to take a plan, we're going to chop it into these paths, and that's going to give us this incremental where query execution. We're saying with this, can we build a model of what's good incremental execution? Can I figure out performance goals? Can I figure out where data is going to change? And based on this, can I hit your performance goals? We're trying to basically minimize the waste. Let's be intelligent about where we do our work and let's try to do a good job at it. So that's what we're gonna do here. So this is gonna be a simple example. We have that this earlier, I'm gonna use this a couple of times here, this A, B, and C here. So I have my query and going to have path A, path B, path C. I have my point in time, I have my point in time in the future. What we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out basically how eager should each path be? And here we're going to use the term pace. Pace is, you can think of it as, this is how many times I should execute this by the time at the end. So if I have path A as pace three, that means you should execute this subpart of the query three times. If it's one, it means batch. Wait till the end and just do it once. So how many times are we gonna execute this? And basically for us in the simplistic cases, we're just gonna evenly divide it between there. We have a uniform distribution rate. If you kind of had a, a wonky arrival rate, you might want to do something different. So here, basically, pace three means do it every third. One means wait till the end. You might have dependencies because it's a query plan. So some cases, you'll have to wait till certain paths are done before you can execute. And you'll have restrictions that you know children can't run slower than parents these before. So our goal is to compare against is systems like Spark or Flink, where you have this knob, but this knob is global. It's for the entire query plan, right? You can turn up the mini batch size and go more frequently. So you can say, make this thing go more and more and more by the end. But what we want to do is we want to say, can I get a comparable latency in the end? Can I get to that same kind of goal? But can I do it with using less work? Can I have done less things in the meantime to get there? And that to us means we're going to be more resource efficient. Okay, so our problem statement is, and I'll explain these terms in a second more, but we're going to use proxies here. So final work for us is going to be basically, you give me a cost model that's going to say how much work is the, is the query doing at the end. So from when I have that last record to when I get it, how much work do I have to do? I'm just going to quantify work as what the cost model says is work because latency is hard. And then how much work did I do in the middle? So how much total processing time did I do? That's our total work. That's our proxy for resources. And our final work, how much processing did I do at the end? And that's a proxy for latency. And these are the metrics we're going to use for optimization, but they correlate nicely with, with latency. And I'll, I'll show that later. 
Okay, so this is the total units of work, comes from a cost model. This is the total work at the end. And this is also based on the cost model. And this is the proxy for latency. Everyone on board with this right now? Good, okay. Okay, so this is what we're doing with MQP. We're taking a model of where data is coming, which tables, how fast are they coming? We're taking a query and our, our goal. I'll explain the goal in a second here. The query, like I said before, it's you know your standard SQL query, what data is gonna be included. The performance goal here is a little bit wonky, but it works for this paper. <laughs> okay, so this is the ratio between batch processing and what the user wants. So again, this is that knob. <clears throat> if you imagine the knob is looking like something like this, and I'm gonna move the zoom window here. Imagine somebody said, I want batch. Batch means you're doing everything at the end. In this case, final work is equal to total work because you do nothing early, right? You wait till the end, you have all your work, you, you, you do everything. So that's one, that's gonna be our, 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 our starting point. We're gonna assume that somebody wants the answer faster. So if somebody was to say, I want it to be at 0.3, they're roughly saying, I want you to do a third of the work at the end. So I'd like to see it, the result basically three times faster, right? If you do a third of the work in theory, you should be about three times faster. So if we're saying, and set the final work constraint to 0.3. That means at the end, do a third of the work. Like I talked about before, that means I'm going to have to do more total work to get there though, right? It's not just three times the work, depending on the query and the data, it's going to be more work. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get to that final work constraint. We're trying to get to your latency goal and we're trying to minimize the extra work that you have to do to get there. Is that clear? I, this is, I know like the wonkiest part of the talk. And if there's questions, this is the best time to ask them because everything's gonna be predicated on this from here on forth. Okay. I've given this talk a bunch now, so I think I'm doing better at explaining this the first couple of times of giving that, that part was a train wreck always. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so with this in mind, we wanna figure out how to set the pace configuration. And again, we're gonna chop the plan into these paces. And now basically, where do I put my money? And we're gonna do this three ways. It's going to be one, we're gonna come up with some new depth definition of incrementability, which is what we're going to use to, to kind of quantify the cost effectiveness of incremental execution. How good is something going to be at doing early work? We kind of come up with a new cost model that's going to compute our incrementability, and we're going to use this cost model in an optimization algorithm that's going to basically be how do I figure out where to set my knobs? So these are the three kind of the key things. And I'm going to start off talking about incrementability here. Okay, so let's start off with a single pace. It's easier to think about this. So again, I just have one knob for the entire query. Let's define incrementability here. Like I talked about a second ago, if your, your pace is one, your batch. The total work and the final work are the same. If I want to make the result faster, I want to drop my, load, my final work, I have to increase my total work. And if you think about it, for a given query, what's your return on investment? for how much drop in my latency do I get? How much more work do I have to do, right? If I have to do a lot of extra work to get that latency down, it means there's not a ton of efficiency. It's not a very incrementable query. If that's a dr sharp drop off, meaning I can drop my final work, I can drop my latency at not, not a lot of extra work. That means in theory that I have a query that's more amenable for incremental execution. So what we're going to do is we're going to define incrementability as a change between one pace to another pace and think about the ratio of the increase in total work versus the decrease in final work. So we're just trying to basically think about the slope and we're gonna do it in proportion between two paces. Cause we do see this kind of shift sometimes in that it's not necessarily you know, uniform. It's going between two points and, and the data change. So if we think about it for a single, a single pace, Incrementability is going to be defined between pace A and pace B. How much does it drop versus how much extra work did I have to do? This is for one pace. Now, because we're going to work with non-uniform paces, I'm going to slice and dice. We can't just use a single metric. We have to change the pace configuration to a vector. So how do I kind of allocate my resources? And we're going to assume that B is faster than A or more eager, which basically means that you know they're all the same or greater, and there's at least one that's greater. Simple definition. Now, the decrease in final work, we're going to have to think about it in terms of just a little bit more complicated cost model for this given configuration. How much does the cost change versus how much does the total cost change? And this is what we're going to use as our definition for how do we define incrementability given a, a cost model. Now, we'll use a simulator to come up with this, but that's how we're going to go about it. Now, this is the, uh, the fun anecdote of research that we've all hit. 
is, you know, when we set out to this work, we had this, we, we came across this problem. We said, oh, this is a great problem. We need to define a property, something like, you know, monotonicity, right? Like you want to define is the query monotonic or not? It's nice, it's clean, everyone will get it, they'll love it, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll be heroes. Uh, but then you realize that doesn't work, right? There's this issue of data arrival rates. There's a lot to do with, you know, these kind of weird curves that happen. So we kind of have to work our way through it. We beat our heads against the wall. And this is kind of the end definition that we send a lot for incrementability. It's not as elegant, but we feel like it works pretty well. Um, but I'm happy to talk more about that later. So uh, it's kind of the realities of research. Okay, so with this notion, of incrementability, we come up with a cost model I'll talk about in a second. And how does this work at a high level is when is we change um, the traditional uh, optimizer, or sorry, the, the cost model for an operator to instead of just think of cardinality, we have to think about it as uh, a triple of, you know, for a given operator, we're going to think about just instead of records in and records out, we want to think about inserts, updates, and deletes. So for a given operator, if you give me a bunch of inserts, is it going to emit a bunch of inserts or is it likely to emit updates and deletes? And this is what we're going to use to kind of figure out where is wasted work happening, right? Because if you kind of have a, you know, think of a monotonic operator, new records and new records out, it's more or less good for incrementability. But if you have something where you get new records in and I'm going to have to kind of change a bunch of work that I did before, it's less amenable for kind of uh, query execution. And this is roughly based on some work from Jeff Naughton kind of back in the streaming days. Uh, we're going to use this cost model with a simulator. So we're going to kind of run through the query optimizer with this cost model to kind of figure out, you give me a, a query plan, you give me some kind of statistics, and I will give you kind of the ability to estimate incrementability. Kind of can run through pace configurations and say, given this, where do I expect kind of things to happen? And then with these kind of cost models, this definition of incrementability, we're going to give an, an optimization algorithm that's basically going to be a greedy algorithm to figure out where should I put my, my, my money. Now I'll get into that in a hair more second. So optimization, uh, a little bit more formally, is how do we minimize total work while meeting the final work constraint? You want to go from one to 0.3. How do I do that with minimizing my total work? So the optimization algorithm will work this way. Is we start off with assuming everything's batch. Okay, so we can take this batch plan, we can plug it into our cost model, we can rely on our statistics that we have before to figure out kind of how is our operators going to be for inserts, updates, and deletes. And uh, that we want to say, okay, you give me this plan, will it meet your final work constraint? Am I good? Or uh, should I basically try to do more work? Now, we're going to have kind of a cap, we're going to hit some point in time where where you can't go faster than some threshold, right? Like my mini batch size can't be greater than 100, something like that. So this is just kind of a system configured kind of max. So rather than gonna say, can I meet it or, or am I done? I, I have no more ability to put money into this query. If the answer is no, we have to make one of these paths faster. Do I make A, B, or C faster? And this is where we use our simulator and our, our, our cost models to say, well, let me kind of play hypotheticals. If I was to say going from one, one, and one to one, two, one, one, or one, two, one, or one, one, two, what's going to be the best return on investment? So here we're gonna say, let's use our cost models or simulators and figure out which one gives me the highest incrementability, which one would be the best, right? If I put it over here, like, I, and that's just updating the average and not doing anything else, I see that I'm likely to have the biggest increase in incrementability. And so this is what we'll do is we're going to kind of greedily search using this incrementability to figure out basically where should I put my, my return on investment? We'll pick it, we'll set it, and we're just going to keep looping through until we hit those conditions. So it's a greedy search algorithm uh, where we're trying to say, at some point in time, do I believe I'll hit that final work constraint or do I tap out and say, I can't actually hit that? Okay, so this is how the optimization algorithm works. Okay, so that's the high level bits of how this works. How do we implement this? Well, the first system, like I said, we built in PostgreSQL. Um, it's a bad choice for building a system like this for various reasons, but maintaining state in Postgres is a bit of a nightmare. So we decided to shift to Spark for this uh, version. Um, so we implemented this inside of Spark SQL. Uh, we had to do a lot to get Spark to go a little bit faster. So we took a lot of uh, Shivram's uh, thesis work and implemented that there to kind of lower startup time and cache plans and so forth. And we're going to, uh, and we feed in data from Kafka as a data source. We're going to compare NQP against the, what we call the incremental oblivious baseline or the incobliv. And this is basically mini batch size. And here, what we're going to do is we started off by just saying, oh, you want your latency to be 0.5? Just double your mini batch. We found that actually does a bad job in a lot of cases. So what we actually do is we use our cost model to figure out what's the right time to set our mini batch to, which does a better job at getting to that, that target goal. 
So we're relying on our cost model, but a uniform pace configuration for the whole plan. Okay. We do the full TPCH, so we have the ability to support nested queries and non monotonic queries. And then we introduce two kind of hand rolled queries to highlight cases, you know, where you, you're basically doing a join against an aggregation or an outer join that are simpler queries to understand. Um, we try to keep memory pressure up, but not, not relying on uh, running out of memory. So we kind of have two, uh, if the query involves line item or not, we kind of adjust the scale factor just to kind of keep things interesting. Uh, we have data coming in at one gig a minute and we set our, our max pace to 100. So our, our mini batch size can't be higher than 100. So I'm gonna start off with one query first because I think it explains the results a bit better and then I'll show the whole query suite. So this is query 17, which uh, you know we do well on and, and the baseline does bad on. So again, before I was talking about final work and total work, now what we're gonna think about is latency. So how long to get the final result after the last record arrives and when you start that final query execution. And what we wanna think about is how much extra CPU time was used to get that result. So when the constraint is one, it takes about 100 seconds, but because it's batched, there's no additional CPU time, right? This is what we're saying. This is how it took 100 seconds. There's no extra work to get there. If you set the, the constraint to be 0.5, you're saying, I want it in half the time, which we can see is both baselines roughly get to about half the time. They both get to roughly about 50 seconds. It's not perfect, but it's close. But what we can see is because the NQP is on the left, we're able to get to that latency of about 50 seconds with using about 10 less seconds of CPU time to get there. So for that total time, we were able to run with 10 fewer CPU seconds. But more interestingly is as that constraint gets smaller and smaller, saying I want that result to be faster and faster, 10%, 5%, so forth. In the end, this is our goal. So we both don't hit it quite, but we both do a good job. We're able to get there, but we use way less extra time, right? We did it in about 35 seconds versus 130 seconds. Okay, so this is this is one result, and I'll get into the, the broader sweep of things. But this is what we're going to do: is we're going to kind of set a constraint, a latency goal. We're going to set it pretty aggressively. What we want to say is how much less extra CPU time did I do to get there? And then at the end, I'll show basically how close did we get. Both of them miss a little bit because again, latency prediction is brutal. But we, I'm pretty happy with being that close to the lines and having the slope go down. So that's what we're going to do. Okay, so for TPCH. How, did, how much less CPU did we do to get there? I'll show just the overhead first, and then I'll show the latency. So here, what we're going to do is we're gonna say again, what's just the overhead? So higher is worse, lower is better. And when you look at that full suite of queries, about half of them are super amenable to incremental execution. Like their work where there's not a lot of ways to work. I'm not gonna show those because they're about the same. But half-ish, do uh, there's a difference between the two of them. So again, I, we tested all queries. I have all queries, but I'm only gonna show the ones with wasted work right now. We try to say, go for 2%. The cost model sometimes says, I can't get to 2% of the latency. I can't do it with your mini batch size cap of 100. So in this case, we fall back to 5%. Right? This is great because our cost model says, I can't do it. This is the next best thing. So those ones have the star. The, the smaller queries uh, that have a lot to do with line item are marked with the, the hash. Okay. so. Overall, the first thing is great. We can see that NQP is, does what we want ask it to do in general with using much less CPU time, right? So some cases it's close. Again, for the other results, they're more or less even. There's some cases where the difference is very, very disparate, right? Like query 15 or this aggregation joint. And these cases are basically, there's a, there's a lot of instability in the query, right? You have a max operator, you have some sub execution and you're doing some form of of maintenance of this max operator. And as that max operator changes is you're just invalidating huge swaths of work. This is going back and trying to justify that, that there's sometimes wasted work, stability is a factor. And so if you can understand that and know when it happens, you can be much, much better about figuring out, well, if I just do work over here and ignore that, I can get too close to the same result without wasting a lot of time. Query 17 was that prior query that I just showed. And you can see that, you know, there's a pretty stark difference here. So this is saying I can do it with less work. Well, how do we do? We're trying to say like, I have a goal latency, that number, how good did we do it? So this is that final work constraint, you know, modified by the batch. And basically we're on the right, it's on the left. Both of the times, this is in seconds, sorry, I don't have that on here. We both miss, you know, if we miss, we kind of miss by about a second on, on median. If you look at the average because of those query 15 and 17, it gets a lot more skewed for the, the single knob, it's 10 seconds versus two seconds. 
There's cases where both of them hit it on the dot. In the worst cases, we miss the query latency by eight seconds and the oblivious approach misses it by hundred seconds. So this is, we do a pretty good, good job of getting the latency, not a great job, but I think these results are more important here is that we can be better in certain cases of figuring out how to do it. So uh, NQP is saying I have a performance goal. Given that goal, given a goal, given how things are coming, can I be more intelligent about how I put my resources into the system? NQP and IQP are similar. They're targeting slightly different scenarios, bursty data, kind of more of a continuous data. Uh, what we want to save is slightly different memory versus computation. And there's a whole lot of things that we've been working on that I'm not talking about today. Uh, we had some work that Sanjay Krishnan led, which was this, if you give me bounds like, um, hey, only update this result when the result, when the query changes by some threshold. Can I do this without actually executing the query? And we've got with minimal annotations on raw input data, like I've got 10 records and these are the, the ranges of those values, we can actually intelligently defer things without violating performance. We had some work at last ICD about lazy data loading and client assisted data loading. So can I push some mild regular expressions to a client that can help annotate the system that allow me to figure out what I need to load and what I don't need to load. Uh, this last SIGMOD we looked at uh, when you have shared query execution and you have this notion of incrementability, you can make better decisions and basically trying to say like, look, shared query execution is not always a good idea, especially when you have disjoint performance goals and you have different notions of incrementability. So how do we exploit these things to make better decisions about when to share, when not to share and what to share? Uh, and then a bunch of the work on those kind of smaller things that I talked about the query registration and performance policies. So what are we doing now? Well, Spark turned out not to be a great choice either. So we've been building the system from the ground up in Rust for the last year and a half, uh, which has been fun. And that's largely to have really fine grained control over what to keep, what to execute and so forth. So we just basically need more knobs and hacking it out of an existing system was arduous. And right now we're focusing a lot on state sharing. So like really fine grained state sharing, partial state sharing. So like, why well, just keep the whole hash table? I can just keep three buckets of the hash table. So how do I do that? Um, fine grained schedule. Scheduling, so like exactly figuring out when to execute things, how to execute it, that that escrow bulk data loading that I talked about, and then focusing more on a, a more cloud native style execution of you know, putting things in using serverless and so forth. All right, so that's my whirlwind fast cramming in 60 minutes into 35 minutes talk of, of Crocodile DB. <clears throat> Again, I, I think uh, it's been fun working on resource efficient execution, right? Especially with people like you on the call, it's hard to win the arms race for speed always. <laughs> so giving a new dimension of resource efficiency opens up new uh, opportunities for figuring out where to kind of put investment on return. But I think it's overall an important problem. And obviously this was done with a, a lot of people who are smarter than me. So thanks and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>